All right. Well, welcome everyone to our webinar today. The topic is construction, succession, and business planning during COVID-19. Uh, we've got a couple of great presenters. Uh, I am Chris Wittick. I'm sort of the moderator today and I'll be asking your questions. Um, just a few things about the webinar today. If you click on the Q&A, which is either at the top ribbon or maybe on the side or the bottom of your Zoom window, you can ask questions. And we do have plenty of time for questions. And so we, we do encourage you to ask your questions. Uh, we will get to them at the, end of, uh, at the end of the webinar, but also if they relate to the topic we're talking about, we're gonna take some of those questions and interject them into each section. Uh, you should also be able to see the questions that other people have asked and you can vote up the ones um, if you have a very similar question and you really want that one to be answered you can just click an upvote uh, on someone else's question and that just makes it more likely we will get to it uh, and and take that question up to the panelists so that you're not uh, we're not getting the same question several times in the the q a uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Blake Nelson. Morning, everyone. Uh, Blake Nelson. I'm an attorney with Helmuth & Johnson. Uh, happy to be here today and to have you all join us in this virtual setting. Uh, some of you may have been to our building in the past where we have a nice big fancy seminar room that now sits mm -hmm. empty. Uh, but uh, my primary area of practice over my 25 year career has been representing contractors and uh, businesses in the real estate industry. So I've got a lot of experience representing contractors in various things uh, in all walks of their business, including a lot of business succession planning, buy sell agreements and the like. So uh, happy to be here today to share a little bit of our insights on um, succession planning and how it uh, uh, pertains specifically to businesses in the uh, construction industry. And uh, I'll turn it over to Randy Feld to uh, introduce himself. <clears throat> Thanks, Blake. Good morning, everyone. I'm Randy Feld, and I'm a partner at Boyman Berenture. And I spend a lot of my time at working with specialty contractors, general contractors, engineers. Love that space. I think we um, there's nuances, and and the people in the industry. I just we uh, I really love working with this uh, those people and and you. Um, a lot of work in financial statements and understanding, in some ways acting as an interpreter of financial statements because of all the complexities and percentage completion and working with owners and banks, bonding companies, making sure that everyone understands it. Sometimes I feel like we're multilingual because it's everyone's talking about things in a different language, but um, love that. We do a lot of consulting on succession, um, like Blake mentioned. Um, succession, business value, some ESOP planning, M&A, but really just trying to act as a trusted advisor and partnership with our customers. And especially, I think during COVID, it's really apparent that we need that um, that we are a trusted advisor, um, and that's such a big part of of financial and and what we do as business people. So. So the uh, quick just agenda for today, uh, a little bit of an introduction, and then we really have six topics that we're going to cover. So if your questions are about these topics, uh, we'll sort of get to it at the end of each segment. Uh, first one, sort of the internal versus a third party uh, potential succession. There are very big differences there. Looking at stock versus asset sales. Uh, what to do with the key people, valuation considerations, sort of the, just the process of succession planning and then getting ready. And then we'll have a few final thoughts from each of them before uh, more of a dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll jump right in uh, with the introduction. Blake, why do you think this is such an important topic? It's important. Uh because construction businesses are unique in many ways. And um, we see businesses be sold every day, but construction businesses and the way they operate, their contractual relationships, 
Um, I have found over my years of representing contractors and, and businesses in the construction space that they just have unique issues that need to be looked at in trying to sell a business, not only from contract standpoints, valuation standpoints, the key people standpoint, how they operate. I mean, in many ways, they're very similar to a business, to a, any old business that might be sold, but I think that uh, construction is somewhat unique and unique enough to warrant uh, this type of a, of a webinar to kind of go over some of those differences in what pertains to, to construction industry companies. Uh, so if you're looking at our agenda today, um, the first topic that we are going to talk about is internal versus third party sale. And the way we'll work it today is I'll give a little bit of a legal overview and then I'll turn it over to Randy to give some financial perspective on each of these topics. As, uh, as Chris said, if you have a, a question um, that pertains to one of these slides, go ahead and, and, uh, and put that out there. We're happy to field it if it looks like it's something that would uh, pertain to the slide that we're, that we're working on. So when we talk about internal versus third party sale, what we're talking about is a difference between selling your business to someone from inside your company, like a key person or another shareholder or a key employee, um, you know, selling it to someone like that versus an outright third party sale. You're a company that is up for sale, a third party buyer, a different entity comes in, buys it, we have a closing, boom, you're done. That's a third party sale uh, versus an internal sale. So from a legal standpoint, when it's all said and done, you've sold your company, but the documentation and the structure is usually pretty different. Um, if we're talking about a third party sale, we're talking about likely a closing where we're gonna have a purchase price that's paid at the closing. And um, that's it. Maybe the seller stays on for a limited period of time to do some consulting, um, but the purchase price is mostly paid at closing. There might be some escrow or hold back for future events or contingencies, but for the most part, the buyer comes in, pays, buys, done, transition. Um, with an internal sale to key employees or key people, it's probably going to look much different. Um, there's probably not going to be a big payment at a closing. This is going to probably be a transition over a period of time where key employees are accumulating shares over a period of time because many times those key folks don't have the financial ability to just cut a check. And um, maybe there's some deferred compensation or something that's set up to allow them to share in profits and then use that money to go towards buying out those shares. But eventually, you know, they're slowly but surely accumulating those shares from the seller, the owner, and then there may be a closing, so to speak, but probably the seller is still going to be owed money. Um, and we'll have a promissory note or some sort of payment agreement where even if the key folks finally take over running the business and the seller's out of the picture, that seller is going to still be probably relying upon them to make future payments to the seller. Uh, in which case the seller probably in that case wants to put in some controls and think about how to do that early on in the process uh, to strategically maybe keep some control of what's going on with that company. Because, you know, your fortunes of getting paid are, are, are based on how well the company does and you may not really be running it anymore. So hopefully the people you've sold it to uh, do a good job. Uh, but some of the strategies that we've seen is you could create a board, you know, and then you stay on the board. Uh, after after you've sold, so to speak, you're still on the board, so you still have some input. Um, you you could have separate classes of shares, um, where maybe you know you've sold them the financial shares, but you still have some voting shares until they pay you off entirely. Uh, maybe there's a consulting agreement where you're involved with um, consulting with the company for a period of time, so you kind of know what's going on. Um, you certainly want to get personal guarantees from the folks that are paying you the money, so that if the company is you know, running to the ground, you've still got personal liability of the folks that bought, bought you out. Um, and then you'd wanna for sure retain a, a, a security interest in the shares. That you, and when I say shares, I just mean the ownership in the company. It could be an LLC, which is a membership interest or membership units, stock in a company shares. When I say shares or stock, I'm just kind of referring to the ownership interest in the company in general. You'd wanna retain a security interest in those shares because um, if they don't pay you after closing on an internal sale, you're gonna wanna be able to get those back 
uh, or at least a portion of them back as your as your collateral because that's probably your 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 security for for payment. So um, as you can see, I spent a lot more time on the internal sale because there's a lot more to it usually <laughs> with the documentation. I mean, with the third party sale, you know, if you're if you found a buyer, we're basically drafting a purchase agreement and having a closing uh, with some nuances. With an internal sale, there's a lot more to it. So I'll turn it over to Randy as far as some of the financial yeah. Uh, differences. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Yeah, and I love the voting, non-voting, um, and some of those legal things that I think it's such a key thing to make it easy for an owner to say yes and, you know, if they're seller financing to, to be able to feel comfortable that um, they've got security and, and sometimes that voting um, still maintaining control through that those voting interest um, while still transitioning um, equity and ownership to that next generation I think can be a really good way because we we've seen that's probably the biggest constraint is people letting go and some of that is it's been their life's work right so it's not easy to do that so whatever obstacles we can do to reduce that I think are tremendous um, my piece you know I I'd say probably 80% or more are internal you know which sort of um, um, agrees with I think what Blake is saying and why he spent so much time on it and I look at the internal as you know management a management buyout or an MBO if you will it can be family often there's family business a lot of construction business have family attributes sometimes it's a combo platter where it's management and family are coming together as an ownership group and buying it once in a while we see it in other industries not as much in construction the owner um, wants to maintain ownership or the ownership group wants to maintain ownership but the day-to-day -day they've transitioned so or they want to transition so they'll hire an executive a president um, a leader to run the business while they maintain uh, ownership um, or majority ownership let's say and and that's usually a phased approach to succession because eventually they'll probably divest from the from the actual ownership of the business. We see another type is ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, which in the right, uh, you know, we have a lot of engineering firms as well. And many of those are the larger engineering firms are ESOP companies. It works well for them, less so in the in the construction area, but it, it can work and if it's um, it can work, but it, it'd say maybe 5% of the businesses, is it a possibility? Um, usually that values, pro it's probably 50 or more employees. And I would say three to $5 million value kind of as an opening start on that. So there's some barriers, the tax benefits can be magical and in the right situation, it can be really, really a good deal. On the third party sale, I mean, usually just to take a, just a different spin. I mean, usually um, like it's either an, a broker, like a Sunbelt or um, one of those, a Calhoun or a couple of local names, um, for example, that does uh, broker transactions. Um, they tend to list the business at a price. So it's, we're gonna list this billion, uh, it's a specialty mechanical contractor, a million dollars, and they'll list the pricing on it. Investment banks are their bigger deal size. Usually, there's cash flow of a million and a half, probably and higher, um, depending on the investment bank. But really, it's a fancy broker that discreetly. Uh, markets the business to private equity, financial buyers, competitors, potentially, but they they let the market set the pricing. So there's no list price. They're trying to create competition for your business. And I think one of the things about doing planning and succession planning is really about business planning that includes succession planning. But if we if you plan you give yourself options at internal sale, external sale, you open the gamut of opportunity. If you don't plan, you just have, you're just more restricted on the back end, um, for sure.
I think the next slide is good. Okay, so uh, next topic that we're gonna talk about is a stock sale versus an asset sale. And, um, you know, if we're just talking about transactions in general, not specific to construction companies, but just business sales in general, um, the vast majority of the transactions that I participate in are asset sales. Um, and there's, you know, from a legal standpoint, there's a pretty simple reason, uh, liability. Uh, the person buying the business, if they buy the stock of the company, they're stepping into the shoes of the existing owners and inheriting whatever liabilities there are. Certainly you can limit those by agreement and have indemnification agreements that say, hey, even though I'm buying the stock or the membership interest, I'm not responsible for this or that and the seller needs to take care of it and hold us harmless. Uh, but usually what the buyer wants to do is set up a new company to buy the assets of the old company so that therefore they're only getting the assets of the company, but not any of the liabilities unless they agree to assume those liabilities, which is common. Sometimes there are liabilities that transfer and are assumed by the new company. So it's very common to have an asset sale and usually a buyer wants that because for liability purposes, they want to start fresh. Um, however, in the construction setting, I see it to be a lot more common to have a stock sale. Uh, and that's not from a financial perspective, but it's from a legal perspective because um, especially if you are in the commercial space or a, you know, a, a subcontractor that has a lot of volume of projects out there, one of the biggest hurdles that we encounter is that you are a party to multiple contracts out there that are going to, and almost all of them probably require permission of the general contractor or the property owner or someone to consent to assign that agreement. I mean, they almost always say, thou shalt not assign this agreement without the permission of the other party. So if you're doing an asset sale, those contracts, I mean, those are the assets. I mean, you might be a construction company that owns some equipment and, you know, things like that, but you know, it's it, those contracts, those existing projects are probably a large portion of the assets of the company. And so if you're going to, you know, if you're going to sell those assets, you have to be able to assign those over to the new company. And sometimes that can be super challenging because, you know, picture it, you've got a, let's say you've got three or four dozen subcontracts out there that are signed with general contractors on jobs across the nation. If you're like a commercial sub, um, you got to go to each one of them and try to get them to agree to sign off on an assignment of those, of those contracts. So, I mean, that can be problematic. So for that reason, sometimes we see a stock sale because then the buyers are just stepping into the shoes of the owners of that entity and there's nothing that needs to be done with the contracts. They're just there. They're an asset that's already there. Um, another, another issue is licensing. You know, Minnesota is unique from some states in that there are kind of limited licensing requirements here. I mean, and you, have to be a, you have to hold a license if you're a residential new construction or remodeling contractor, but we don't require licensing for commercial uh, general contractors or for uh, any subcontractors. Um, you have to register with the state uh, through the Department of Labor, but you don't have to have a license. But there are many states that do have licenses. So if you are working in multiple states, um, you know, there may be different licensing requirements. Uh, Florida, for example, is quite strict and you have to have a license for darn near everything. So with that goes the person holding the license and, you know, what's that look like? So if you are a new if you set up a new company that's going to buy the assets of the selling company, um, that new company will have to be credentialed wherever those projects are. You'll have to get your own license set up because, you, you know, if you want to hit the ground day one and be operating after the closing, you need to be licensed wherever the selling company is licensed, or you need to have whatever permissions and the, you know, certifications and the like are required wherever they're operating versus if you were to purchase the shares of the company and step into their shoes again, it's very likely that those licenses could stay in place for a period of time. Even if those licenses are held by, let's say the selling shareholder, he or she could consent to remain the license holder for a period of time until you can get your own, you know? So that's another hurdle that we see. So there are others that we could go into, but those are the two that come top of mind as far as sort of why I would usually see a stock sale versus an asset sale. Again, I think asset sales are more prevalent, but, um, you see them more in my experience with, with the sale of construction companies. So 
Uh, that's it from a legal perspective. I'll turn it over to Randy about some financial points. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Um, yeah, and, and in my, you know, sometimes it can matter really significantly on the structure of the deal and whether it's a stock transaction or an asset transaction. I think there's so many legal things, and Blake did a nice job of talking about those. I think on on stock versus assets, accountants, we can't help but just be tax focused on this. And a lot of it comes down to income taxes. And usually there's winners and losers on you know, the buyer and the seller negotiation. And that's why, you know, as Blake mentions, sellers want, you know, sellers want to sell stock because they get preferred tax rates, um, which is capital gains rates, which right now um, we'll see what happens next year. But right now that's 20% federal in broad terms and 10% state. So it's about 30% most of the time, which is a good overall rate. They love having that capital gain where on the other side, the buyers don't get, don't get any new deductions for that. So they, they, if, if they um, buy that business, and I'll, and I'll give an example, if, if, um, if they buy that business, let's say for, for $3 million, they get no new tax deductions. They just carry over what the, the seller had and get no new tax deductions, where if they buy assets, they're gonna get, um, they will get some deductions for that. And conversely, the, the seller will probably pay more in taxes. So I'll give an example. So let's, let's say we have a business that has equity of $2 million. So the, the assets minus the liabilities of that business are 2 million. And let's say, um, not unusual. And let's say the tax basis of those assets are two million, uh, just to make it simple. If the business is worth, if let's say we have a valuation or the people have negotiated a price and they say the business is worth two million, which is basically the same as the equity um, or book value of the business, then a stock or an asset sale, the difference is is not going to probably be as material. Now, if the business is worth three million and the book value is two million. That difference, that million dollar difference, is called goodwill. And now we start to have some differences because buyers, if they buy that business for three million, they can amortize that million dollars of good, goodwill over 15 years and get a bunch of tax deductions. And then also the other two million for the other assets of the business, usually depending on how capital intensive it is, includes a bunch of equipment that they can depreciate. So now if I spend $3 million and I get a bunch of deductions, it helps, it helps them buy the business. Um, sellers pay more in tax. And I think as Blake said, we see a lot of stock transactions, mostly because there's so many inside transactions or internal transactions where people are proactive in getting ownership to, uh, to key employees. And when key employees own 20% of the business in stock, it's, you end up where it's more challenging to then do, to later do an asset transaction. So when the final, when the final transactions happen, they tend to be stock transactions. One point on what Blake, you know, there's a cool provision, and not a code section guy. We'll we'll get our moderator Chris Wittick's uh, feedback on this topic, I think, too. But there is a provision called 338 H10, which basically allows Blake's affiliate, you know, affinity for legal protection and all those contracts and agreements treats it legally as a stock transaction but tax wise treats it as an asset sale. So in the right situation, that can really, I can accomplish both objectives. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. There's, there's innumerable little nuances, I'd say within this space. One other big one is your entity. So C corporations almost always wanna sell stock. Buyers, as we said, rarely wanna buy stock unless it's a management buyout. 
so just planning on the legal structure becomes really important um, in advance of this, not waiting to the year of, but planning that and looking at that pretty consistently. Chris, what, what things do you see in this area? Yeah, I mean, there are certainly some huge, huge tax ramifications. Um, and there's big differences between asset sales and stock sales. We got the 338 H10 election, which is, can really be magical. But I mean, you need to look at the tax planning very specifically because it's gonna be different if you've got the C Corp or you've got an S Corp or you've got a partnership for tax purposes or even uh, like a Schedule C uh, for tax purposes. So there's, there's quite a range of potential outcomes. And I mean, this is, it's going to be a big, big event. There's going to be a lot of cash changing hands. There's going to be a huge tax liability. Um, and so it's really finding a way to make the best of both worlds. You gotta, you gotta do the right thing for the legal side but you also got to keep an eye on the ball for tax purposes or you'll you'll end up in a in a crummy tax situation even though legally you're all uh, set to go so just definitely you got to keep both in mind and it can be a balancing act sometimes great points guys especially uh, Randy pointed out that another reason the stock sales are so common is because of the internal buyouts. I mean, it just, you know, that's a very common transition plan for construction businesses. Maybe there's family members involved, et cetera. So speaking of those key people, uh, they are important to uh, a legal structure uh, in a number of ways. Um, it's important to secure the right people with agreements um, as you're looking towards selling your business. And this could be, this is, this pertains to an internal sale or uh, a third party sale. But the types of agreements I'm talking about are, you know, with employment agreements, non-compete agreements, non-solicitation agreements. Um, maybe there are some profit sharing agreements or some, some other types of documents that incent them. Um, if you were looking, if you're the type of business that you think, hey, I, I don't think I'm going to have people on my team that are really cut out to buy this business from me. I have a lot of good people. I have some great sales guys. Uh, I have some, you know, excellent project managers that really are fundamental to our business. But none of these people are going to run this business and buy it from me. So I think I'm going to have to sell it to a third party. Those folks that I just mentioned are assets of your business. I mean, they're not going to be on a piece of paper as an asset, but they are fundamental in many ways to running the show. So you want to make sure that you're planning for that. You know, how do you retain those folks? Because uh, anybody coming in to buy that business is going to say, well, how about these four people? Are they staying? I mean, you know, they, they have worked there for 20 years and they know everything and they help, you know, they're basically what runs the business as efficiently as it runs. Do I have a guarantee they're going to stick around? Because if you're doing an asset sale, those people work for the old company. So they'd have to accept a position with the new company. Um, and you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if you have certain agreements in place with them that incent them to stick around, let's say that there is a, some sort of a profit sharing agreement. Let's say they're not buying in, but they just have some sort of incentive to stay because they're getting a piece of the action. Maybe they even get a piece of the action when the company sells, you know, some small amount that they're incented. But the trade-off is they have to agree that they play ball. You know, they're going to stick around and they'll, if, if they're going to get a piece of the action off the sale, a little percentage, perhaps they're, they're going to agree to stay on the team. Um, Non-compete agreements and non-solicitation agreements. That's more of a deterrent <laughs> rather than a carrot. That's a stick. That's like, okay, well, if you don't want to stay with the team, when the, when the business sells, uh, you're on the bench. I mean, you're not going to be able to go work for a competitor. You're not going to be able to try to solicit our customers. Um, so what are you going to do if you don't go with them? You know, so that's more of the, that, that's sort of from a different perspective. Um, so I think that, you know, looking at those types of issues early, and if you can identify key people, um, you want to secure them early on. Um, if, you're, if you are thinking you're a candidate for internal 
turnover, like to sell it to key people. The same thing applies, except it's different types of agreements. Now, instead of kind of locking them up as a package to sell to someone, you're trying to get them to enter into an agreement with, with you as the seller to buy you out over a period of time and, you know, get those agreements in place um, early enough where you're not looking at this at the finish line. You know, you don't want to be 65, like, okay, I think I'm going to think about retiring in a month. Um, who should I sell this to? I mean, you want to be looking at that quite a ways in advance, obviously. So that, um, from a legal standpoint, that's, those are kind of my thoughts on the key people. Randy? Yeah, no, those are, um, people are complicated for sure. And, and some of it's, I think some of it's money and some of it's um, all the soft things that go into that. We had a, a general contractor that, you know, as Blake was talking about, you know, how do you tie up or retain key people? Um, we had helped them set up a, a non-qualified plan for kind of their management team. They were all um, pretty talented people and he wanted to really, the owner um, was a single owner company wanted to keep the band together long-term. So they set that up. One of those people was really a rock star. And as we, as we, in the last year or two, that, that person has generated a disproportional piece of the firm revenue and, and, and profits really, um, key person. And so we went from this non-qualified plan to actually, um, you know, equity ownership in the business. And I, I think it's such a big thing to identify those people um, web, and early on as much as you can and to, to take the steps to, to make sure that you can retain them. Because the barrier to entry, to, to leave to a competitor, to start your own company um, isn't that great. So I think taking those steps is really important. I think a lot of the, the people stuff is the soft things that I think sometimes when we're so busy, um, it, it, it takes a back seat. But I think the training programs, the mentorship, leadership training so that with the, throughout the organization, um, institutionalizing that is huge. HR where you have a pipeline for talent at different levels in the business. I mean, it's such a big issue. It seems like the recruitment um, is, continues to be an issue even during COVID. Um, so I think establishing those practices, I'm a big believer in getting key people and different levels of your company in the associations, all the, all the trade associations and giving them opportunities for leadership and, um, building the company and the brand of the company. And then I think there's some great opportunities for owners and for their key leaders on um, groups like allied executives or CEO Roundtable or Vistage, these peer groups. Um, they, have, they have them from young people to more senior executives, but um, there's women owned business things that have the same thing, but getting them involved with peers communicating on and those groups tend to deal with you know people process um leadership things and just really helps um establish i think a foundation for building your people because if you build your people retain them um you've got assets you know no matter what your path is you're going to be in a great situation and i think it's just so much rewarding um down the road so if, when you do exit to have sustainability and to have legacy um, is a pretty cool byproduct of, of doing the right thing with the people. That's a great point about getting your people uh, sort of advancing their business knowledge and acumen, I think. Um, I've seen it happen a number of times where the reason that, you know, there's a lot of good, hardworking folks that contribute to the business's success, but none of them even know where to start if they had to sit in the chair to actually run the business. So if you could, if you can train those, if you can give those people tools to learn and grow, not only in their day-to-day -day job, but grooming them to sit in the chair someday. Yes. I mean, that's a great point, I would say. Um, 
So, all right, the next, uh, the next topic we're talking about is valuation considerations. Um, you know, a lot of this is more financial than legal, but I can give you my perspective from watching deals happen that my two cents is you want to choose a valuation method that's realistic and isn't destined to fail. Um, and obviously we don't know, we don't have a crystal ball if something's destined to fail, but, um, you know, if let's, you know, talk about uh, an internal buyout. I mean, the plans that I have seen fail are the ones that are way too complicated or there's a moving target. Like, and, and I'm not saying there can't be some fluctuation in the valuation and a formula or something that, that we're calculating, but many times what I've seen is that by the time the key personnel are getting, they think they're getting to the 10 yard line and then they do a recalculation at the end of the year and they're like, hey guys, we had a great year, but it turns out you're only on the 50 yard line still because there's like this sort of um, on this double-edged sword where it's like the better the business does, the higher the value gets and the more money it's got to cost these people to buy and the price of the shares keep going up. Um, and I've seen a number of these fail where, you know, it just, the company was successful to the point where these owners, even with a profit sharing or something, could not afford to continue to buy the shares. Um, and so I think that that's a, a realistic consideration that you have to look at when you're, so you don't, you don't want to sell yourself short, but you also, I don't think can get too greedy because if you're in a position where you have folks that can actually pull this off, like actually not only be ready to run your business, but swing paying for it and everything else and are willing to, you know, don't get too greedy. Um, if you're also a third part in a third party sale, what I would say is, and the, the accountants are, are going to talk more, you know, can talk better about this both today and offline big picture, but again, get a baseline of some sort. I mean, you need to kind of know what you're dealing with. Like, what is your business really worth? Um, because I've had too many folks that I've seen charge down the path of getting all ready to sell their business and they don't even have any idea what they're really going to get for it or what they think they're going to get for it is ridiculous. You know, they're not going to get that much. And then they spend a lot of time trying to, you know, brainstorm legally how we're going to do this and go find a buyer. And then their, their offers that they receive are woefully lower than what they anticipated. And now they feel stuck because they've been going down this third party sale path and haven't been grooming anybody internally. And now they're, they're jilted uh, by the, you know, by the buying public, nobody wants to pay what this guy, what they think it's worth. And so now the owner feels stuck. It's like, well, I, I guess I got to sit in the saddle now for a while and see if I can, you know, increase the valuation or what have you. So early on in your process, I would urge you to really carefully consider what is the valuation of your company so that you can have that in mind. And then you can work with your attorney and your accountants to try to grow that or what are some strategies you can use to try to build on that. But, um, you know, but that probably goes without saying with a third party sale, but I think my going back to the points on the internal buyout, you know, you have to make sure that you're being fair with these folks um, to make sure that you're not creating a moving target where um, they can't afford to eventually fulfill the agreement that you've struck with them. Randy. Yes. Realistic. You know, it, it's one of my uh, partners, Phil Paquette says this um, he uses this appropriate amount of self-interest vernacular. Um, and I think on a management buyout, when you're doing an internal, there, it's, it's, it's super relevant. Because if, if you get greedy on, on value um, to the point where you win, but the buyers and the management can't make payments or are financially distressed, it's just not a good situation. So I think the more you plan in advance, and we'll talk about this on the readiness piece, but the more you set the tone that you don't need a home run um, on a management, on an inter internal deal, I think the more success you have. Let's be clear, if you go to a third party, a broker or investment bank, you're trying to, it's okay to get greedy there. <laughs> right? You're trying to create competition for your business. You've probably done a lot of things right. And it's okay then, um, I think, to be more so that way. 
um, you're trying to, you're dealing in a financial transaction, you're trying to maximize it. The internal is different. It's sustainability, not that you don't want a third party to sustain with your business, but internally, um, it's much more about sustainability, legacy, and making sure that both parties win. Big picture, I think there's so many things on value. People, you know, hey, my neighbor sold their business for 10 million. Mine has got to be worth at least seven. Um, there's a lot of rule of thumbs. And, and I think as owners and leaders, just getting some basics, you probably do, but I'll, I'll touch on a few things. Um, what business value, three major components I think drive value. One is the cash flow. Two is the growth of that, the growth rate of the cash flow. And three is the risk. So if I'm a contractor where there's a lot of volatility, inconsistency, I have lost years, some profit years, that those risks to cash flow in the business diminish value, right? Um, so and cash flow can be defined in different ways, but in, in general, a few different ways. Net income is a great measurement, um, usually for valuation or for selling your business. There's a, a term called EBITDA or EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. I really wish someone would shorten that up because <laughs> it takes you like 20 minutes just to say it. Maybe it's just me. But um, a variation of that is EBIT, which is shorter and is a really good proxy for cash flow, I think, in a construction business. And that's earnings before interest and taxes. And what that does is it takes out the ad back for depreciation, but also it doesn't factor in all the money you have to spend on equipment. So it's really a good way of kind of measuring debt-free, tax-free cash flow. Um, so we talked about those three things that drive value. And from my experience, the subtleties that really make the difference between high values or book values or lower is if you have if you have sustainable revenue streams in a construction business recurring revenue service businesses monitoring um master service agreements anything that you can develop recurring revenue from a business standpoint it can be really tough to come by but building that into your model if it isn't certainly brings a lot of value the earnings and the multiples of that business is more than a business that has to fight for every project every time. No, you can still be a, a project-based um, contractor and have a lot of value with relationships, specialization in vertical markets, reputation, the, you know, the niche market I think is big. Obviously the people having a tremendous leadership team and field team um, drive value as well. So those things that are really beneficial and enhancing one of those components, either cash flow, growth, or risk. There, if you're good at those things, you probably enhance potentially all three of those areas. So big picture, um, we could spend, this is a, a separate seminar, right, on, on value, but just trying to give you a few nuggets for you as owners to understand. Companies are kind of valued three different ways. Uh, this market, market approach, asset approach, and an income approach. So market, less applicable to construction, definitely to engineering firms, but not so much to construction because they're, they're hard to find transactions that are posted with brokers. So companies, we can look up transactions for a general contractor throughout the country or a specialty contractor. Um, we can see transactions that were posted by brokers, but like we've said, a lot of the deals are internal buyouts, so they never get to brokers. And so the market approach is not used very often. We, we look at it to understand, try to find similar companies and understand what the market bared for those. So it can be good, but just less often used. The asset approach is more that example we talked about um, an asset sale versus stock sale. If, 
it's looking at the equity of the business. And a lot of internal buyouts, um, buy, buy sell agreements with shareholders might be more based on, hey, if our equity is $2 million, um, we're gonna do, a, we're gonna, if we valued the company based on this asset approach, we would look at all our, our equity and try to write those up for fair value as opposed to what we have in our books. But often in practice, we'll just say, hey, the, under this asset approach, our book value is two million. You know, we, we have, everything's hard bid for us. We have no recurring revenue. Let's, let's go with an equity buyout or maybe a 110% of equity. So this asset approach can kind of can be a floor on value or a very reasonable exit price between in a membership control agreement. So um, often we might start there with a discussion. And then the last one is this income approach where we talked about EBIT, EBIT or EBITDA, measuring the cash flow earnings from the business. That's not revenue, that's you know earnings, um, you know, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. So if we look at the EBITDA, historically what that's been, and we, and we look at the models, the growth rates of that, and we look at what we expect in the future. Are there changes in business? Have we really ramped up a segment of our business? So we try to quantify what that future income is. Is past income a proxy for future? And then, so let's say that's a million dollars of EBITDA or EBIT, and we put a multiple, um, this is hypothetical, obviously, um, but let's say there's, we, we determine through research and, and formal valuation that it's a four multiple. So million dollars times four is $4 million value under the income approach. There's a million dollars of debt on the financials. We subtract out the million dollars to get to an equity value. And that's $3 million. That's, that's sort of this income approach um, on how business are valued. And, and really at the end of the day, whatever approach you use, the income approach is really what, <laughs> you need cash flow in the future to be able to pay for, for obligations, right? So buyers need future cash flow and the more risk, um, the less growth, uh, the, the, the just drives down value. Obviously the inverse, the more cash flow, the better the growth rate and the things that you do to reduce risk as much as you can, really in an industry that's born of risk, right? Um, those things all drive value. But I think, you know, Blake's point, you know, just being realistic and I think really planning ahead, you don't need to hit a home run on an internal deal if you do that in most cases. Yeah, great points. And obviously I'm sure a lot of people on the on the on the webinar today are thinking to themselves, that's you know, the value this is all great, but valuation is what I'm really concerned about. Like what can I get? <laughs> for my business. Right. So, right. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the process. Um, you know, legal advice is important. I mean, as you can hear from Randy talking about valuation and the like, I mean, realistically, where if someone came to me and said, hey, what's the process for selling my business? I would say, well, I can walk you through the legalities of like kind of the step-by-step -step of what this would usually look like, but you really want to first analyze the financial aspects of of the transaction and, and I think prepare that way, you know, with some valuation and some other, you know, review of your financials and are there, is there a leak in the boat that you need to plug in order to, you know, move forward. Uh, but in brief, you know, the legal process, at some point you're signing an agreement. It doesn't matter if it's an internal buyout or if it's a third party buyout, you're working towards getting an agreement with someone and that agreement will have the terms about what that's going to look like. And then there's going to be some sort of a closing at some point. Now with an internal buyout, it could be over a period of a number of years. Um, you know, a typical structure or the process that I have seen is two key people, uh, maybe one is a family member and one's a key person, um, have agreed to buy the business from the person who started the business 30 years ago and they're gonna buy the shares and we've come up with a formula for how that's gonna look. 
and at the beginning of the day they each get a little piece of the act a little piece of the company like a little percentage so that now they are technically owners on day one of this transaction so now we can put them into a buy sell agreement with us so that if something happens like they leave you know they they, they quit whatever there's a trigger to get their shares back that they had um or if there's something bad that happens or if they start competing or something like that, you know, you can kill the deal and get their shares back. But let's assume it goes fine. That process is going to look like, you know, each year they're going to get some money for their ownership percentage. There's probably a certain component of bonus or deferred comp that has been developed for those people to get them even more money each year to help throw towards the purchase price. So as the seller, you might be looking at that and going, I'm letting them buy myself, buy me out with my own money. But um, you know, that's sometimes necessary. And then each year you do a, a settle up and, and then there's a share transfer of some sort where they're accumulating more shares. And then eventually you get to maybe a five year mark where then maybe it tips over into a creditor situation for the seller. So in other words, hey, you, know, you guys now own 51% of the company. I'm out, you know, um, you run it, I'm retiring, I'll stay on for a while maybe, but otherwise, you know, uh, you're gonna sign a promissory note and we're gonna, you're gonna pay me over time and now I'm basically a creditor to your business. Um, and that's why I talked at the beginning of the, in one of the earlier segments, you know, you maybe wanna bake in some controls since you're in control of this process and what I have found in representing the owners of the businesses that are selling, we're not trying to take advantage of anyone, but by and large, you are in control of how we structure these. And it's not that common for the key employees to, to get too in depth with their own counsel on these, I have found. So um, there's a lot of ways we can bake in things that favor you, not necessarily to the detriment of those buyers, but you know, during that process, we can do that. So you know, that's an internal buyout process. The process of a third party sale, quite a bit more straightforward. I mean, other than all the marketing and getting the business ready, I mean, if you find a buyer, we're going to do an agreement. There's going to be a closing. There's going to probably be a due diligence period in between. So they sign a closing. There's probably a due diligence period where they're looking at all the financials and maybe, you know, then the, then some of the question becomes confidentiality during that process. Um, you know, who can they talk to, for example? Um, there's, here's this, per, here's, you know, do, do, the, do the employees even know the business is for sale? Probably not. Because you don't want it because you don't want the you don't want people to jump ship. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, he's selling the business. I don't know what's gonna happen to me. Um, you know, so it's very common that my clients want to keep it confidential, you know, until it's like a done deal. And then they announce, hey, I've sold the business. Um, and hopefully you've got those key people locked up. Um, but the buyer is probably gonna want to talk to some people, you know. I mean, it's not, you know, if you're going to go buy a car, you probably want to drive it. If you're going to buy a business, you want to talk to the people that you're going to be, that are working for you, you know? And so you sometimes walk this delicate balance in the process between confidentiality and letting the buyer kick the tires. So that's part of the process that can be somewhat challenging. But eventually, if you get through all that and they do their due diligence and they decide, yes, we're proceeding, then we have a closing and the deal is done subject to, you know, if there's some sort of escrow or holdback or something, a part of the purchase price that gets paid out later, maybe based upon some contingencies or things that need to happen. So um, from a legal standpoint, that's a very brief overview of kind of the two different process uh, aspects of, of an internal versus a third party. Uh, I'll turn it over to Randy as far as some financial points. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Um, yeah. I I think the the sooner if we make this part of your business planning process, because it kind of is already when um, we we deal with people retiring or leaving, you know, we're 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 constantly looking at our company and what gaps do we need to fill. Um, so just business planning and succession planning are just. I just think succession planning is really part of business planning, which just means start this early. Um, I think identify your timeline. So if, if you start this, let's say 10 years, you're doing business planning and you know that you think you want to exit in 10 years, I don't think that's too early, um, to, to, to look at some of these things that we're doing. Um, 
some people start earlier. A lot of people five years out, they start doing it, which isn't too late by any means, but the longer you have, the more you can influence the outcome and really prepare for this whole thing to, to make it good. So I, I think um, start early, set a timeline. Assembling a team becomes important. It's, you know, the reason Blake and I are here is because we, you know, I, I think we're part of a team of people. Um, sometimes there'll be a financial planner, a valuation person, a consultant. There's people that just do exit planning. Um, but forming the team, especially as you get toward the end, I think having a consultant or your trusted advisor early on with the planning process to help um, is an important thing. But the team's really big um, to make sure you don't have blind spots and you maximize the opportunity and the success really of this. Um, like we said, it's it's really um, manage it like it's your most important project. And you are all very good at managing projects. So this is just a big one that takes over a period of time. Then I think that last thing is, this, and we, our last slide kind of deals with this on readiness. So assessing where you're at on all the functional areas of your business. And certainly the financial and value is a big part of that. And we'll kind of um, talk about that. But where am I at today? so I can set a plan to, to get to the finish line and hopefully drive improvement and value along the way. Yeah, uh, we've touched on some of these items already today, uh, focusing on agreements and preparing and you know, early on identifying key issues like you know, what is your company worth, who are the key folks. Um, but you know, again, plan ahead with those agreements and it doesn't have to just be agreements with key folks. I mean, you might not be in a position to do that for some reason or another. You might not have a key person that that even applies to, but there are things you can do. I mean, I would not, I cannot tell you how many times a client comes to me for the first time and whether it's just to sell their business or they become a new client of mine and I ask to see their corporate or LLC record book and they're like, come again. Uh, you mean, uh, you mean that thing I filed with the state? Um, you know, they don't have a record book. They don't have bylaws. They don't have minutes of meetings. They don't have anything appointing shareholders as officers. Um, you know, uh, many times they have some uh, minority interest owners even and don't have any type of buy-sell agreement with those folks. So this might not be a person that is destined to run this company or buy out the majority owner, but maybe they've already got a little piece of the action, they own 5%, 10% of the company, but there's no buy sell agreement. So when it comes time to sell that company later, how are you gonna drag that person along? I mean, I guess you can just try to have a vote and claim I'm in charge, but it's a lot easier if you've got an agreement that very clearly spells out, here's the deal. You know, I can drag you along in this sale and they get the tag along too, right? I mean, they're a 10% owner, they're gonna get something out of that. Uh, transaction, but you don't want the, the, the tail to wag the dog. Um, and, you know, just any of those uh, corporate things or things that you can be working on getting ready, in addition to the key person uh, type items. Another thing that you should start thinking about is, um, you know, those contracts and the licenses and things like that. I mean, how are those structured or, or what are you doing with those? Um, I have one client that I was have been advising that I, I know that they want to sell their business and they are in one of these industries where they do a lot of commercial subcontracting work. They're a subcontractor signing a lot of these agreements. And, um, you know, we have a strategy of trying to revise the assignment clause in, in those contracts. Usually that's flyover territory. Nobody ever pays any attention to it, but, they have a strategy now when they get these contracts that they're looking at if a general contractor asks them to sign a subcontractor agreement that they ask to modify the language of the assignment clause to say that it can be freely assigned um, as long as notice is given to the general contractor and that there's no uh, disruption of the work or pricing or terms or anything like that. 
Um, so, you know, if they got to the finish line with a buyer and they had all their contracts that were in place successfully had that provision, they wouldn't be worrying about the clause that I talked about where, you know, they can't assign any contracts to the buyer and do an asset sale. Um, same with your license holders. I mean, who are those people? Um, you know, maybe it's not the best idea to have those licenses and everything tied to folks who don't have any skin in the game. I see many times contractors that I represent, if they do have licenses, they've got an employee that holds the license for them. Not an owner, not an officer, an employee. Well, if that person quits, you know, or you're trying to sell your business and they quit, you know, now you're scrambling. Like you're, you know, trying to figure out how to replace that person. So, um, you know, it's probably a good idea to vest those important things in owners of the company that are going to be around so that you have control over what happens with those. Um, and then, you know, the final thing that I would throw out there is leases. You know, think about your lease. The next time you renew, if you're not owning your own building, if you're leasing a property or something, think about long-term. If you have a, if you're going to try to sell the business at some point in the next five to 10 years, I mean, don't sign a 25 year lease. Um, you know, Side, you know, keep in mind the strategy there that you want to probably leave your options open because, you know, you don't want to be subject, you don't want to be stuck on the hook for an eight year lease. So, so it, but then you sell your business in five years and now you got three years left on a lease and the buyer doesn't want anything to do with your building. You know, um, they don't want an office there. And so now you got to try to figure out how to get out of a lease or, you know, sublet it or something. So, you know, there's some not that complicated planning that can go into, you know, hey, if I'm going to, if I'm leasing my space and I'm, I'm up for renewal of these leases, maybe I should have some forward thought to, well, where do I want to be in five to 10 years? And maybe I should accordingly, you know, draft these leases to allow for, or alternatively allow for some sort of a termination early with maybe a, a payment or something. So at least if you had to, you could cut bait on the lease and get out of it. Um, so those are some considerations, I think, in getting ready from a legal standpoint. Um, I'll turn it over to, to Randy um, for some of the financial uh, tips. Sounds good. Chris, do we, do we have questions for people? I want to be respectful. I think we're right about time right now. Um, I've got a few things I want to talk about, but I don't want to do it at the, at the price of questions, too. If we uh, have, uh, no, I think I think we're okay on questions for now. We can uh, wrap up this, and then I've got a few uh, for the for the thanks. group. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So, yeah, I think let's say we're five years out, and we're trying to assess if we're ready to do this. Um, I think that assessing do, doing it it doesn't have to be a big fancy formal assessment, but I think there's some steps to take to try to improve the business because. Um, usually people at the end say, I wish I would have had more time if, if they start late in succession. And so let's say you have five years. I think going through the functional areas of your business, it starts with people, right? Do we have gaps in our org chart? Do we, do we desperately need a PM that can sell that we've been missing on our team for a while? Is there a safety person that's missing? Um, what does that succession look like? The retirements? And then is there potential, are there owners in there that I haven't communicated, future owners? And what do I need to do? So assessing your people is huge. Uh, we talked quite a bit about that. I think one of the overlooked things is how people manage their business. We've seen more, more companies in all industries, but I've seen a, quite a few in recent years go to an EOS model, an entrepreneurial operating system, if people aren't familiar with that. Uh, there's a variety of different mechanisms like EOS, but it's, 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 it's really exploded in the Midwest, but it's really a process to manage the business. And sometimes what I've seen is one owner or two owners making every decision, everyone reports to them, and then when they exit, so making that assessment on, our, on what is our process or system to manage the business. I think assessing the legal, the accounting stuff that we're talking about, the risk management, where are our gaps on that? Uh, Blake touched on a bunch of the legal stuff. On the finance, do you have you know, audited financial statements, reviewed financial statements? What is our, you know, what's our historical earnings, our five-year 
our five year um, average EBITDA revenue? Um, what's our EBITDA margin? There's a whole bunch of things, but fundamentally, do I have great good financials? Is that a buyer if I if I go to the outside or my internal team can rely on? So the financials become very big, um, especially from an accountant, right? I mean, but and then I think one overlooked spot on that is technology. I think the industry has been a little slow on adoption. It's gotten better, but the technology piece, assessing that, I think becomes a big thing. I'd also look at governance. Do you have an advisory board? Do you need one? Um, I think vetting that out, it's a good time if you're at five years out. The baseline value, um, like we've talked about all along, really understanding that now, probably having a calculation of value, at least consulting, maybe a formal valuation to see what that looks like on the business. Um, once you have that value, and we're all me we're measuring this at the, in our example at the five year mark, if we don't like the answers, we have time to at least make moves to improve it. So what the after tax cash based on my value. Um, and then that really ties into the personal plan, which we, we talk about on this slide, splitting off the real estate and excess working capital um, out of the business so that you can start to create wealth personally and have a personal plan. Um, so really then digesting your personal plan, what that looks like today, what it looks like when I plan to exit, um, is, is, is huge because if we can take off some of the financial burden, if you're comfortable, that sets the tone. Lastly, there's a lot of psychology in this and knowing yourself on, am I going to be Sid Hartman where I ha where I'm going to work to hundred and never retire? Um, or am I ready to call it quits at 65 or 62 and what's next? Because that'll make it a lot easier to to transition and do the things that you need to do to make it successful for the next generation or for the third party that you sell it to. Um, but doing a personal assessment, not formal, just what are you gonna do next? That's So, I mean, I think that was a great um, sort of summary from each of you. Thank you for your, for your thoughts. I think this has been a great, um, a great presentation and really showing how you need both the legal and sort of the accounting, the financial side covered. Um, sort of one, one last closing thought from each of you. Um, I mean, we've sort of talked about these six big topics. Um, what's the first step to get started if somebody wants to work on this and then maybe um, do you see it being any different here during COVID or is it sort of more of the same process, but obviously we're doing things like uh, remote <laughs> meetings with, with folks. So Blake, what is, uh, what's sort of the first step and, and what are maybe some other issues that might come up here during COVID? Sure. So what I usually see, the first step is usually talking to either an attorney or an accountant. And, and um, I would say that in most business settings, people are more likely to have a regular accountant that they deal with annually than they do an attorney. Um, so, but either of them I think would be a good starting point. But as, as Randy mentioned earlier today, you wanna, I mean, you don't have to assemble the entire team th that will serve you the, throughout the process, but I think you need to get at least some, some, a couple people on the squad to start talking about it early on and give you some direction. Um, Cause starting early and having the pieces of the puzzle in place early helps. And so getting started first steps, I mean, talk to your accountant, um, talk to your attorney. If they don't seem to have a lot of background in that, I mean, you know, if they're kind of purely, well, I just file tax returns, but I'm not really a succession person. Um, you know, reach out to someone who is, uh, or try to ask for a referral, um, you know, to, for that type of thing, because I, it, I think it makes sense to get the team in, in place, but make sure that you don't just grab team members that you know, just because you know them. I mean, you want to have the right team members in place. And many times if you talk to 
the first correct team member that you can find, they can tell you who the rest of the team needs to be and bring in people that they have worked with and really help complete that, that, um, that group. So uh, I think those are some of the first steps is just talking to some folks that know what they're talking about uh, in order to kind of help you get started. Uh, as far as COVID goes, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, it really doesn't change um, too much unless you're somehow in a business that restricts legally doing what you want to do. Like if I was representing a restaurant or, you know, a health club or something where, you know, right now they're operating, but, you know, what if they get shut down again? You know, so there could be some legal considerations there, but, um, you know, I'd say that it's probably more of a financial consideration in COVID. I mean, is your revenue, what, what is, how do you sort of predict what's going to happen with your business because of COVID? Um, and, you know, nobody knows how long this is going to take to work out of this current situation. So I, I think it'd be more of a financial question as far as the impact of COVID. But I think from a, from a legal standpoint, there's really, you know, so much of our world was virtual anyway. We're emailing, we're talking on the phone, you know, so yeah, you're not having a lot of in-person meetings, but putting these types of deals together very rarely involves in-person meetings, frankly. So um, I think that that for by and large, from a legal standpoint, I don't think COVID really affects the process too much. Yeah, I think it starts with a conversation with your the a trusted person that whether it's your accountant, attorney, um, um, whoever's in that your most trusted advisor seat, having a conversation and saying, hey, I'm thinking of, I wanna plan out our business and I need some help. And it's, uh, you know, we kind of laid out some of the things to assess readiness and a process, but that conversation I think is really where a lot of this begins. And I, I think the earlier, not to beat the dead horse on this, we make it part of our business planning then it's just part of our KPIs and our metrics. And we just are thinking about it because ultimately the point of business is to grow something, maximize value, um, help people along the way, but it, it doesn't, you gotta, it starts with a conversation. I do think it's so important because if you want to maximize the value, if you want to create that legacy and sustainability of the business and, and really do it thoughtfully and be happy when it's done for, for you and for, um, for others. I think uh, that's why the, this is so talked about, right? This whole thing is talked about so much to the point of, um, but it's important, so. So on the, on the COVID and, and really the financial side of things, I think if you're looking at a really a short term um, potential sale. There are some unique issues. If you got one of the PPP loans, there are some rules about how or if you can sell your business. And there's some escrowing of money, potentially. There's informing the banks. There's getting permission from the SBA in some situations. So um, it, I mean, this is really in in the short term the COVID uh, issue. I think if you if there's a PPP loan involved, there are special considerations. I would also say if you got an EIDL loan, which I think some construction companies did, maybe not uh, a ton, but I think with those EIDL loans, there are some unique considerations, and that might be more of a, a shorter term consideration as well. So, I mean, I, I do think there are some COVID specific things, but I mean, to both Blake and Randy's point, if you're looking at a five-year horizon, um, I, I think the COVID is, is maybe just a small blip on your trajectory towards your five-year plan and working through your succession. Um, so again, if people have questions, they can throw them in the, the Q&A, but we've got a few other topics here um, that came to my mind as, as I was listening to you guys talk. And so um, I know union is a very common uh, thing for employees in this space. 
maybe first Blake and then Randy, how would um, employees being part of a union impact this type of planning? So from a legal perspective, you know, these union agreements are very binding and restrictive. Um, you're sort of, once you're in, you're in. And so once, so if you're selling a business that's a union shop, as they say, there are additional considerations about how you even do that. Um, you know, for example, if you're trying to sell the stock in the business or if you're trying to sell, you know, is there any type of change in control provision in your union agreement that says, you know, not just selling the assets, but just like if you're, if, if, if someone else is going to be owning the business or at least the majority of the business, you need to get our permission um, for that. There's also liability considerations from a legal standpoint. I mean, you know, you sell a business that has a union agreement. Um, in many cases, the personal owners of that business that signed that collective bargaining agreement or that union agreement um, have personal liability if they don't pay. You know, if fringes aren't paid, if the right amounts aren't paid, um, if they get, if there's an audit and there's some discrepancy where the union says you think they think they got shorted in some way, if it gets bad enough, they'll not only go after the company, they're going to go after those owners. And, you know, how do we deal with that potential exposure if the company's being sold? Like, what if the company is sold and, you know, there's a union audit afterwards that determines that there was some something wrong before the company was sold? So now, you know, who's going to be responsible for that? Um, is it the old owner? Is it the new owner? Are they both in the soup? Um, you know, so those are things that need to be looked at. And there's definitely additional legal uh, analysis. Uh, the, the final thing I would throw out there, which is a topic that could take up a whole seminar, is withdrawal liability for unions. And um, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds there other than to say, you know, the idea of withdrawal liability for those who aren't familiar with it is from a legal standpoint is that just because you're paying your dues and your fringes doesn't mean that the union is solvent. So they rank and they classify different unions based upon their financial stability. And, you know, they give them ratings and colors and all these different things. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you're, if your union is not, if your union's a red light, meaning that that's, it's weak, you know, you're paying into this union and you're in complete compliance with, with your agreements. You've got, you've paid every penny that you were supposed to. If you sell your business, um, in certain circumstances, there can be what's called withdrawal liability, which means that if that, you know, in other words, if the business is no longer going to be part of the union, they, they say, oh, you're leaving. Um, okay, well, uh, you know, you were part of the team and there's a total team debt here. So if you're going to leave the team, here's your share of the, of the, you know, shortfall of the, of the fund. And it could be, huge. I mean, you know, it could be a lot of money. So there's obviously, if that's not going to happen in every business sale, and as, as I said, it's too far beyond today's discussion to get into the really deep, you know, considerations there. But if we're talking about a union business, those are things that we need to look at as we're selling the company. Yeah, my, my first call on this is always to an attorney, because it's, <laughs> um, and what I would say is that my experience is that if you're a union contractor that's um, going to sell and going to stay union, no, no issues. Yep. Um, if there's plans for the buyer or family to go non-union, I had one where it was um, the family had no ownership, but wanted to buy it from the founder and they got a ton of heat and ended up, basically uh, wasn't a good situation. So if you, if you keep those attributes, I think you're fine. That's what I think Blake was saying, really. The withdrawal liability, I think people get, I've heard people get really fearful on that, even from a business value, like, hey, my, my business can't be worth anything if I were to withdraw from the union or you know, the, the pension fund is underfunded. 
my experience is, yeah, the, I think in general, the funding status of the plans has gotten better. Um, Teamsters, I don't think is good, but there's most of the cons pure construction funding, it seems like they're, they've gotten better. Many of them are green status or improving. The market's been volatile, of course, but the reality is you're probably not gonna have a withdrawal liability. Um, I, we certainly hope, right? Uh, unless you act to move out of the union. So if I have a liability that I'm never gonna, never gonna have to pay on, which is hopefully what a withdrawal liability is, then the cash flow from the business is worth something and people will pay for that. Um, so you just have to be very thoughtful in those situations. I mean, I'm sure Blake's dealt with the double breasted issues um, quite a bit and, and yeah, it just adds a level of complexity. Yep. Definitely. So um, an another, I think, common issue is what to do with the real estate. Sometimes, um, as Blake was talking about, you're just leasing a property from an unrelated landlord. But sometimes you as the business owner, you own the property and you, you do have a lease. It's just with yourself. So how does the real estate that might be owned um, either in the same entity or perhaps in a different one, how does that come into play when you're looking at succession planning and maybe selling, selling your business? Blake? So very commonly, the business owner will also own a separate entity that owns a building and then, you know, so let's say that's an LLC that is set up called Real Estate LLC. Real Estate LLC leases the building to construction company LL, uh, corporation or whatever. So, um, you know, in those circumstances, I mean, that's what I would always recommend is that you have those separated out and that the building not be an asset of the actual entity, the operating entity. Um, so, you know, if you're selling the business, then, clearly there's different values there. There's the value of the ongoing business. There's also the value of the real estate, potentially there's maybe equity in that building. Um, and, you know, I usually see those as being separate transactions. In other words, you're marketing the business to be sold. Maybe there's some notation in the business listing that there's also a possibility of buying the building, but maybe the seller doesn't want to sell the building. But, you know, if you have it set up in a separate entity, it gives you that flexibility. Do I want to keep the building? Um, or is there is a package deal like the you know I've also seen it happen on a on a number of occasions where the uh, whoever buys the business keeps leasing that building that's part of the deal you know you got to keep on you got to sign a new lease um, so some and sometimes the building owner is going to sell them both you know they're like well I'll either sell it to the buyer or I maybe I'll just put the I'll list the building for sale but if that's your goal then you do have to probably consider whether the buyers will want to stay in that building before you just go off and list the building for sale and, you know, kind of remove it from your control. So, um, it, but I would say that it's very common for me to see a package deal if the buyer can swing it where that, you know, people like real estate investments too. And so if they can make a package deal and come in and buy the building and buy the business, you know, that's, it's pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we'll, I mean, if you own the building on the outside and hopefully it's in a separate LLC, not a corporation, but a separate LLC for that real estate. Um, if you, you know, if, if you still have debt on that and mortgage payments for sure, um, you want to, yeah, you want to have it, it's certainly a key piece of, uh, piece of the negotiations, right? Like Blake said, usually it, it, the buyer may want to buy that as well, but if they don't at a minimum, a lease, right? A, a lease for a period of time is usually part of the consideration of a, of a deal. So, um, but we see Chris and maybe how many times do we see real estate trapped inside a C corporation or something like that? Or Once is too many. <laughs> Uh, so uh, too, too many times. I, I definitely co-sign that having the real estate in a separate LLC is far more tax efficient. And then you really have a choice of whether to uh, potentially sell it at the same time or set up a lease yeah. with the new buyer of the company. It just gives you more options. And those options are also tax efficient. 
which is good. So nice. um, as we as we near the end of our time here, we just have, have a couple minutes left, maybe one or two minutes uh, from each of you. What uh, what sort of the one closing takeaway, one closing thought that that each of you would have, Blake? Uh, from a legal standpoint, I would give you this. It's not that hard to get ready. Um, I would not, you know, a lot of times I think people, I've worked with a lot of clients who after it's all said and done, they're like, well, that wasn't that bad. Um, you know, I mean, if you have the right people involved, um, it's not that complicated. Some people I think feel it's just so daunting that like if they pick up the phone and they talk to an attorney, it's going to be outrageously expensive, super complicated, amazingly time consuming. They're just going to get told that everything they've got is wrong and it's going to be super hard to fix it. And, or they're embarrassed. They're like, I don't even want, you know, okay, I'm going to call this person who actually knows what he's talking about. He's going to look at my stuff and be like, wow, you're a joke. I mean, well, you haven't done anything. You don't have anything. Well, look, almost all my clients are like that when they come to me, <laughs> you know, they're not, they're running a business. They're not, they're not lawyers. Okay. So, um, but it's not that difficult to get up to speed in a short period of time. So I would tell people, I mean, we talked about a lot of things today, but my takeaway would be don't hesitate to talk to people about this and get the process going because if you're working with the right folks it's not that complicated and they can walk you through it and help you get there um, in a lot more efficient and, and timely manner than you might think so um, just take the first step I guess and don't be afraid to talk to someone I love that my yeah I think the most important thing is start um, and take those first steps, as Blake said, non-judgment non zone. This is something that, um, you know, that people will procrastinate on because of the fear and of uncertainty. And it feels like the end when I think it, if it's just part of the planning process, it, it can be the beginning, right? It's, it's just the beginning of planning for your business. So get started. Um, doesn't have to be crazy. It takes some little steps and start with a conversation. I think that's great advice from each of you. And uh, I thank you for participating. I think our participants uh, for, for coming here today, for those who were not able to join us live, uh, this has been recorded and it will be posted on each of our firm's websites, uh, hopefully sometime tomorrow about 24 hours or so. Um, so you can look for um, that recording and go back and relive this 90 minutes of tremendously good advice um, on construction companies and getting ready for succession planning. Uh, so really thank you all for participating. Uh, thanks to Blake and to Randy for the presentation today. And uh, certainly, our, our contact information is is on the screen there certainly reach out uh, and and get that ball rolling get get your squad started um, because they they are both great great resources in the construction space um, so I guess I guess we'll just say bye for now uh, and until next time thanks everyone thanks everyone thanks